Yeah. Okay, we're, we're now streaming live on YouTube for our uh, public, uh, who we will take comments from at the end, as we've been doing via Alex, if that's all right by you, Alex. Um, we're waiting on Michael Klitzing to join us. We also have with us Sarah Powers from Indiana University Water Testing, and we'll get to her in just a little bit for our uh, report. Um, once again, we'll do a roll call vote. I don't think eh, we have much to vote on, but at any rate, we will do it in that manner uh, if necessary. I would move that after we approve the board meeting minutes, um, if it's okay with the board, we would go to the manager's, manager's report D, uh, sediment management project update with the bond parameters and bonding resolution introductions because Patty Zelmer, who looks like she's trying to join now. Uh, I am here. Hi, Patty. Welcome. Hi. I was just explaining that we will put you on just after the approval of the June board meeting minutes so that we okay. can be respectful of your time. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, with that, has everybody had a chance to see those June 2nd, 2020 board meeting minutes? Yes. yes. Anything to add, delete, or correct? No. No. Nobody? Okay. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I move, I move to approve them. Thanks, Mary Jane. Second. Like Second. The uh, I don't know, Laura, is, was that you trying to second? Yeah. Okay, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that we approve the June 2nd meeting minutes. All those, in, uh, roll call, sorry. Laura? Aye. Mary Jane? Aye. Les? Aye. Michael Blackwell? Aye. Debbie? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion carries, Me minutes are approved. So Adam, I'll turn it over to you to uh, introduce our guest and talk about your sediment management project update and the bonding. Yes, we have Patty Zelmer on the call with us today. Patty Zelmer is our bonding counsel from Ice Miller out of Indianapolis. Um, they've been working with us and Baker Tilly, our finance counsel, on getting the bonding documents together for the sediment management project. Um, in keeping with the timeline tonight, we'll be doing our initial um, viewing and, and showing to the public our bonding documents. We'll not be approving them at this time. It's just a first reading. Um, we'll also go ahead and set the public hearing on the bond resolution, which we can just do at the next board meeting. Um, that can be done at the board meeting, so I'll do it then. And that is when we would review it and then actually pass it. Um, so I'm not sure if Patty has a video or if you're just sticking with audio, Patty? Uh, let me see here if I can change my thing up. There I am. Oh, hi. Hello. Oh, sorry. My uh, computer was uh, mandating some updates, so I apologize for being a little late. Um, thanks, Adam. Do you have more to go? Because otherwise, um, I'll just dive in. Um, I guess just right off the bat, we have the parameters letter on there. Um, we're looking at a $1.2 million bond um, over a 20-year term. Um, that's essentially what the parameters letter says. And with that, I'll let you dive into it, Patty. Thank you. Great. Well, Baker Tilly um, provides what, what Adam called the parameters letter, and, and that's the terminology that we use too. And that basically gives us many of the financial... Uh, parameters that go into the bond resolution that we drafted. And uh, they keep their pulse on the marketplace and determine what a maximum interest rate should be, um, what a maximum discount should be, what the redemption provision should look like. All those things are really financial terms. Uh, that they can best advise on based on the market that we're in right now and expect to be in when the bonds are sold. So a lot of the times cushion will be built in there because they can't predict the future. And when you start with the bond resolution at this point, you're typically nowhere at the, the point of selling your bond issue. So the bond resolution that's in front of you basically does a couple different things. 
It authorizes the board to move ahead with the project, provided that the financing dollars are there to do so. And it authorizes the issuance of bonds payable from what's called a special benefits tax in the Conservancy District statute. And that is basically a property tax on all real property in the district. So it's very similar to general obligation bonds uh, for those of you that have been exposed to bond issues before. Um, this particular resolution authorizes for the bonds to be sold in either the open market or to the SRF program. Both options are available. We just thought it made sense to put the most flexibility in there right now as possible. I, I'm i not sure um, which option is gonna be pursued, but, but it does not matter in here because both are available to you. Um, it also basically serves as the contract between the district and bondholders so when bondholders seek any protection or um, any clarification or should they ever not receive payment, this is the document that they would come to uh, to look for uh, protection, enforcement, et cetera. So we consider this one of the, the most important documents uh, in the transaction. Um, a couple things that Adam mentioned and that I have questions on. Um, when we did our timetable initially for this project, we built in steps for the board to adopt an appropriation resolution. And Adam tells me, nope, we don't need that because the board put that into its budget. Um, and therefore the bond proceeds are already accounted for in your budget and we do not need an additional appropriation. I have to say this is the first client that's ever been so forward thinking to have done that. I've never had that happen for a bond issue. Um, but needless to say, that means the appropriation stuff comes out. And one of the pieces of the appropriation process is this public hearing. The bond resolution itself does not require a public hearing. If the board wants to have a public hearing on it, you're welcome to do so. But I just wanted to mention that that bond resolution that's in front of you today does not require a public hearing. There is a um, Another step that conservancy districts have to go through uh, that, that a lot of other entities do not have to do, which is you have to have a public hearing on your drawings and your specs and your, S, your cost estimates. And I am not sure if the resolution that you sent me, Adam, was that, that maybe that step's already been accomplished. We have not. We have uh, briefly mentioned them, but I would say at the July meeting is when we would put down the most recent cost estimate. Okay. Uh, for that. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll get you a notice um, so that you can have a hearing um, for that purpose. So even though the additional appropriation goes away, this other hearing that I thought might have already happened still needs to happen, and, and we'll get that set up for your July meeting. Patty. Uh huh. Patty, this is Debbie. Uh, what constitutes a public hearing? It's not just one of our board meetings, is That's it? Right. Or That's it right. Is? Okay. Yeah, a public hearing is um, one that is published, uh, a notice is published in the required newspapers that apply to the district. And um, as I recall, you all are in two county, right? Right. right. And, uh, the timetable that we had put together identified the Herald Times and the Brown County Democrat. 
And so we would publish a notice in those two papers and it would have to appear one time and the publication in both papers would have to be at least 10 days ahead of your public hearing. And typically when that occurs, you as a board can do that at regular meeting and you open your regular meeting, you typically do your preliminary stuff. And then the first thing on the agenda after that is the public hearing. And, and we have minutes that you guys can follow and sort of say, you know, okay, we're opening up for hearing and we'll hear comments. That doesn't mean you have to answer anyone's comments. Um, if you choose to, you can, but a lot of folks don't. They just open up the floor for comments. And then when no one else wants to speak, they close the public hearing. And that's all reflected in your minutes. And then you move on to what you were hoping to do after the public hearing, which is adopt the, the plans and specs and cost estimates. So the fact that we have it on our board agenda, because I have to laugh, I wonder when the government's going to get with the time, you know, who orders, who, who takes a paper newspaper anymore? I know. Know? So. I know. And there's provisions that also say, yes, you should have an agenda posted at the meeting place. And if you have a website and you want to put it on your website, you can. So you've basically got a, a hearing within a meeting if you do it in this manner. Ding, that is okay. correct. Two agendas then. Okay. Well, one agenda, one agenda. I would still say one agenda. Okay, okay. all right. Mm -hmm. So you- And, you, and it'll be your but meeting- But two different agenda. notifications. Hmm? But two different notifications. Two notices because you have two papers. And, okay. But it's the same notice, and it still has each notice has the same timing required. Okay. 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 Very good. But we can combine that with the announce with the notice of the board meeting, and that in addition, at that board meeting, there will be a public hearing. Not do two separate meeting notices. Do you normally publish your notice of meetings? Yes, yes. yes. we have to. Okay. have already been published at the beginning. We have a resolution that sets those. So we won't need to notify again for the meeting itself. We'll just have to do the legal notice for the public. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Um, you could combine them if that's easier and cheaper, which I think it would be, you know. So I'm okay. fine with that. I just wonder if we need to, uh, you know, the way our freeholders get a notice, it says we're having a board meeting, here's the packet. Now, how many people open up the packet? I mean, would it be in our best interest for transparency, mm -hmm. you know, to also say this yep. public hearing is going to be I, I, I would do that. Yeah. I would try and be uh, up front. Yeah. Give as much notice as possible. Okay. I would. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question, and I don't know if anyone can answer it. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, for this <laughs> for this project, do we envision that any property in the district will have to be taken, meaning purchased or used or damaged? Is, is uh, you gonna need any easements, things like that? I do not believe so. We purchased a piece of property um, towards the end of last year that we'll be utilizing for one of our disposal sites. The other piece of property is an overflow pond adjacent to the lake itself. And we have been given permission to utilize that from the city of Bloomington Utilities. Okay. So there won't need to be any easements um, or actually securing additional okay. property. Yeah. There is just a mailing requirement if that were the case, but it does not apply. So we're good there. Um, it sounds like basically the project is all gonna take place in the lake and then just taking that sediment and, and putting it somewhere else. Correct. Right? Okay. So at this point, um, your July meeting is that is July 18 still accurate? 
Yes. As of this moment, everything's yeah. been pretty fluid, as you can imagine. I can imagine. Okay. All right. Well, we will get you a notice because you're going to need that. Um, Mm-hmm. Patty, mm -hmm. may I ask another question? Absolutely. Should should we still be getting counsel from our uh, insurance agent at that time to continue in the Zoom format? Is it legally possible to have a public hearing in this way? Well, um, for this meeting, how, did you notify um, freeholders that they could attend via zoom yes and they are uh, joining via youtube at this point yes yeah, it would be and and do they have the ability to comment or yes yep. uh, yes mm -hmm. they do yeah it, it so, would be the same thing okay. and Perfect. um at that point um i'm not real sure i think we're at a point where we might need another executive order to extend that i can't recall what this one goes to I believe they said we can do the digital format on our own regard up until the phase five, which is okay. on July 4th. So they wouldn't need to extend the executive yep. order on that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just have to see how that goes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so I owe you a little notice um, language that you can add into your other notice. Um, and I can email that. Yeah. Who would it best be to Adam? To Adam. Yes. Okay. Adam. Okay. And um, at this point, um, the action that we typically see when we go before a common council or a town council and they've got a document like you have in front of you, typically we see uh, uh, discussion and questions like we're having now. And then we see a motion by a board member to pass it on first reading. So you're not adopting it. You're just passing this, this resolution on first reading, meaning carrying it over to the next meeting when you were consider it for adoption. Okay. Okay. But I can answer any more questions y'all might have. Well, it's several pages. Is it fairly standard? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> do we um, need to read it all? <laughs> um, and, and if you want, you know, to reserve next meeting for more questions, I am totally fine with that. A lot of it, um, I, I would say none of this is really what I call boilerplate. Um, this would not work uh, for any other entity except your entity and your project. Okay. So okay. Um, it's not what I would call boilerplate. Okay. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we had to pull in certain provisions that I do consider boilerplate and I've seen them in other documents. Um, but uh, conservancy districts are one of the, I guess, fewest issuers that we work with in, in our group. Um, there's just not that many of them. And you all don't do bond issues that often. So there's not a, a ton of these done. However, I believe that there's enough um, recognition of them in Indiana that from a bond perspective, the ones I have worked on where they're payable from the source that you guys are pledging, the bond market likes them. They they like them. So that's a good thing. I guess was that and one of the questions that I had was regarding the earliest um, date or time frame that we can start calling the bonds that we have issued. And I can't remember if that was five or eight years. And at um, that point, we would be able to, to call. I'll on tell those. you where to go for that. That's in section three. And it's on page 13 in the copy that I just printed. And we have subsection B as in boy. 
And we have two different options, if you will, because if these bonds end up selling to the SRF program, there's a 10 year call protection built in to that particular financing because that's how the SRF program operates. The second paragraph in subparagraph B says if they're not sold to the authority, then the soonest you could call them is no sooner than five years. So there's five year call protection. The exact provisions will be determined when we get closer to, to selling the bonds. And if you go to the SRF program, then we know what it's gonna be. But if you end up going to the open market, we know that this bond resolution has what we call this five year call protection parameter, meaning you can't call, you can't sell bonds with call provisions for three years, but you could call, you could sell bonds for, um, with call protection for six years, seven years, eight years, just no sooner than five years. Okay. So that's the parameter that was utilized. And then another question that I had was regarding the Indiana Finance Authority Exhibit B. Yeah. And the way that I kind of read that and uh, would just like maybe a little clarification is that it seems that as we are dealing with the contractors and have invoices, we would not be receiving the funds all at once. We would be submitting an invoice to the finance authority and then they would have final approval of whether that fits within the parameters as they see it and then authorize the experience. Right. <clears throat> the way <clears throat> the SRF program has been around since the late 80s and it got um, revamped considerably in the 90s and it's now run through the finance authority and IDEM and it is a very well-run program, well-oiled machine and um, one of the benefits of the program is that if you qualify for what I'll call their traditional money, um, then the bond issue is set up as a draw bond. So you have, let's say you close on October 25th, okay? You have a million two sitting there available for the district but you don't pay any interest on that until you start drawing money out of it. So it lowers your interest cost. Um, and there, that, what you just said, how they have to review it and whatnot, like I said, they, they are a well-oiled machine. There's never been complaints about projects being held up or not funded appropriately. They make sure that by the time we get to closing, that your project is acceptable and, and they're going to fund it. Adam, now, have you, Patty, but, about the purchase of the truck then? I'm kind of thinking about turning in this invoice of something that we already bought, you know, I mean. Oh, you've already bought a truck? Right. And that was part of this 1.2 million. So we just have entered into a finance arrangement with the bank. And part of the thought, it's not that we don't have the cash, but is that we will, of this 1.2 million, 200,000 was to reimburse us for that. So I'm just wondering if that is gonna fly. Um, so the, the, the truck was purchased when? This month? Will you fill in, Adam? Yeah, it was uh, the end of May. May, you know. May. Purchased the end of May. All right. And you lined up uh, financing with the bank? Yeah, so utilized a local bank on a short-term note um, at 2.5%. Um, and the goal was our, our truck that we're utilizing um, stopped working and was no longer fixable. So we needed a truck to do that. So the goal and the, the plan was to get that financing with the bank. And then in October, when we close, just go ahead and pay off that short-term note with the bond monies. Okay. Okay. And the idea being that it is being used for 
uh, preparation of the deposit sites and things like that, correct? I mean, it is integral and it needs to be, right. we have to use it as part of the project. Am I correct, correct if, on that? If, if the bonds sell to the SRF program, that's a question for them, okay? Um, and, and it may or may not. That is not something I can sit here and tell you one way or the other whether they would consider that a qualified project cost. Okay. Um, if you do an open market bond issue, there's absolutely no problem. Um, Quick question, uh, Adam, I saw though that there's an articulating dump truck on the 2021 budget. Is that a different truck or is that the same one? Um, I do not have, there's an articulating truck on the 2020 budget, the off-road truck. Okay, I thought it was under the 2021 column. I may be mistaken. Yeah, I think it's under um, 2020 this year. 6704 is zero. Yeah. Well, okay. I know right. that as the pro project description, which is attached as exhibit A to this bond resolution, it does list out the purchase of an articulating dump truck. So is that, is this same truck we're talking about? Right. Yes. Okay. We don't need to yet. <laughs> okay. Nor can we afford to? Okay. How <laughs> many? <laughs> How many dollars was that? Um, 225,000. All right. Well, you budgeted, yeah, 235, and then it seems like like 231 or 226, you sent me a number. Um, yeah, 226 and change. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we would have to ask the SRF about that. Okay. Right. And there's another, um, I'm glad you, you said that because um, whenever a governmental entity like your district is going to issue bonds and they want to spend their own money before they actually uh, issue those bonds, uh, we, we oftentimes adopt a reimbursement resolution. But in this case, you're telling me that you didn't spend any of the district dollars you borrowed from a local bank, right? Correct. Okay. So part of this financing, uh, when I, I think I'm going to tweak the bond resolution a little bit to state that it, it will include uh, payoff of a short-term bank loan um, uh, that was received uh, to, to purchase the truck. So that'll be part of the project cost. All right, and I will send you those numbers exactly. That'd be great. Because we will have actually probably made a couple payments by the time we get the money. So we might be out a couple of those $12,000 quarterly payments, but actual payoff. Yeah, All right. would, I'm gonna add reimbursement language just in case um, you, you have any local dollars that, that you use that you want to reimburse, okay? Right, because some of these bond costs, yours and Baker Tilly's, those two were reimbursable, correct? Is that kind of a foregone conclusion? Those costs are built into the 1.2, right. So we would just submit prior invoices that we've already paid to you guys and say we uh -huh. want to reimbursed um yeah um the one that you paid us last year mm -hmm. is that what you're thinking mm -hmm. um what I do we think like SRF, 30 40 thousand total yeah, I, I don't know if srf would allow that okay um, uh, open market you could add it in i don't think baker tilly built that into their numbers um when they did their particular letter here let me see if it breaks that out. Well, they probably just don't have it. Yeah. Because the more that you look to reimburse yourself, the yeah. less dollars you have for the project. Right, right. Okay, and well, so, we just need to consider that as a board, I guess. Yeah. I'm, and how that affects our budget. 
the cost of of doing this project will sort of dictate how many extra dollars you have. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, I've got, this is probably pretty basic, but I mean, is there anything in there about risk? You know, in other words, like what could go wrong? You know, what do we, is there anything we should be heads up for? Um, risk to the district? Yes. Well, there's nothing in here that obligates the district to do this bond issue if costs come in high, that you're not obligating yourself to do anything until you actually have a bond sale or have a closing with SRF. So in, in terms of that, you're not taking any risk. You're, you're, everything in here does not obligate that to happen unless you get to that, that point in the timetable. So adopting the bond resolution does not obligate the district to do the project, doesn't obligate you to issue the bonds it all just is based on you get the hard cost in and you've got a project that's viable and that'll fit within the budget and then you move forward. Um, other than that, um, there's no quote risks that are identified in here um, uh, that, that need to, I guess, be discussed. Um, typically this is just a document that authorizes a bond issue. It makes it very clear what the payment pledge is um, and uh, makes it clear that it's only one source uh, for payment of those bonds. Where Where is that reference in there on the one source? I was gonna ask you about that on the special benefits. I mean, that's just our, our regular taxes, right? And then we would have the ability to this would be a debt service levy. It would be a new levy. It would be a new and separate levy uh, for the district that would be only to pay these bonds. So does that mean we would have to pass a tax levy in order to do this? This particular process that you're going through gives you the authority to do it. And uh, Baker Tilly helps their clients upload what's required to the DLGF website mm -hmm. and, and file the documents that are required so that that levy will be in place next year if you do the bonds this year. <clears throat> All right, so currently we have in our budget and one of our line items a debt service bond repayment of $85,000 that's budgeted and taken into account in our current special benefits tax. So would we need to do an additional tax or ask for the additional debt service tax or can that be included in our current ask that we're doing now? Or, or somehow separate it and identify one as debt service and because we're going to use part of the tax revenues that we've already got. Yeah. The, this would be a new tax. It would clearly be a new tax and everything in it, everything that's levied would go into what's called a bond payment fund. And I am looking at section 10 and 11 of your uh, resolution. Okay, that's pages. Uh, 26. Yeah. Okay. So section 10 is the one that talks I see about it. All right. And so once the bonds are sold and you know the interest rate and you know the maturity schedule, there will be a certain debt service levy that will be required every year to produce enough dollars to pay the principal and interest coming due that year. And that is very much a Baker Tilly assistance sort of thing. Gotcha. Okay. All right. 
right, so I'll reach out to Baker Tilly then because it sounds like we'll have to take out that 85 out of it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why you have that, and I don't know what to make of that, um, frankly. So well, we have that in there because we we're anticipating receiving the bond monies this year, and if we had to start payments this year, that way we would have the funds in there. Okay. 2021. Yes. I got and, and all the reports that they've done have shown what our current tax levy is and then what the new tax levy would have to be. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of thinking maybe it is just they're going to have to, I don't know, because the thing about the special benefits tax levy is I think once those bonds are paid, then it goes away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So and, we'll and maybe we'll they probably. thought they saw this coming and they wanted to build that account up for you to pay interest right. uh, next year and, and and not have to wait for the levy to kick in because we, we tax, you know, in arrears. So that might have been why they had you put that in. I don't think we asked them about it, quite frankly. <laughs> okay. Right. No, the only thing I asked them about was that we would have to put the funds for that would have to create a new two new accounts one for the bond proceeds and one for the repayment mm -hmm. and i'll reach out to them as my understanding that we could just the monies from the special benefits tax we'd put into that account but i'll make ask them about doing a completely separate tax levy okay are there other questions for patty And Patty, I think we don't know what to ask in some ways. We're working on it. I, I, I appreciate you completely. And again, you know, we can talk a lot more at the next meeting as well. Well, that would give us some time to read through it and get exactly. some input. From exactly. Billy. It was a lot. Um, do we know? Um, there's, I do have a couple more questions. I'm going back to my timetable here. Are we still anticipating bids for the project in August? I have talked to a few of the consultants that do the hydraulic dredging. I let them know that we likely would not be starting work until this winter time or the spring. Um, so we could still look at soliciting the bids in August to go ahead and lock that in. Um, so I'm, yes, I don't think we've deviated from that timeline. All right, okay. Because that is an important component of the timetable because it dictates what, what this whole thing is going to cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's number one. Number two, um, we had a um, action item on our timetable for the Bloomington Utility Service Board to provide its consent because of this lease that exists between the two. And I'm assuming that is still required and that lease is still in place. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, through my conversations with them, they wanted to wait until we had kind of the financial documents or they saw that it was clear they had no liability within those documents and then they would create the resolution. All right. All right. Um, well, maybe after, maybe we'll consider going to them in August. By then you'll have your adopted bond resolution you can send them, okay? Mm-hmm. And that would work because that would show that we're paying from our special benefits tax. Right. All right. Okay. Okie dokie. So even though the project might not really start moving and shaking until next year, you think you can lock in costs this year? I think the earlier you lock them in, probably the better. Um, yeah. So long as they're willing to do that. I mean, yeah. this, this sort of project is something that I have no experience in. I'm normally water sewer where, you know, contractors are willing to hold their bids for a certain period of time and then that's it. 
And by statute, you know, you could make them hold it for as long as 150 days. By agreement and by contract, they can hold it longer. Yeah. Um, but um, I just want to make sure that whoever the interested folks are that would do this work, that they're willing to say, yep, this is our price and we're okay with starting next year at this price. I wanna make sure that's all known at the outset. So when we solicit bids, just put that, you know, we're soliciting the bids, but here's when the anticipated work will start. Right, right, right. I don't, I don't think that'll be an issue. We can include that when we do the bid solicitation. Okay. Well, they'll let you know if they don't like it. Yeah. I think sure. they'll let you know. Yeah. All right. Okie dokie. Um, who should, so I'm going to send you a little notice for this public hearing language, and I'm going to update. Uh, the bond resolution for the next meeting to build in the payoff of the bank loan and add reimbursement language just in case. Otherwise, I don't anticipate any changes. I did see one item, I, I believe in the first sentence, it talks about the Lemon Creek Conservancy District. Did anyone else see that? And I know it's just a matter of changing it. Um, oh, so there's a mistake. Where Where is that? I believe it's in the first sentence. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Lake Lemon. Okay, so we're yep. the Lake Lemon Conservancy District. I'd I, love it if Lemon Creek, whoever they are, would help us pay for this, but um, I doubt that. I don't even us. know that that's existing. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure how that happened. Yeah, that's but, all right. That's, just... I'll, do, I'll do a global search and make sure that didn't occur other places. Okay, thank you. I didn't I didn't dice it out every page, I must admit. I'm the one who drafted this. Uh, I couldn't delegate it to anyone because it was so unique. And I, I it really did take hours. And so I just thought, you know, I just got to dive into this and do it. So I can do a spell check, but it doesn't catch stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> I have one question. Yeah. Uh, you talk about property impact. There, there would be a property impact to the two people that live on the overflow pond. They don't own the overflow pond, but that it would be impacted by having a pond and then later on having wetland. Just we threw it out there for you. So they live next to it, if you will. So they live yeah. on it. Hmm? Next to it. Next to it. Next to it, yeah. And uh, is there any expectation that the proximity of the pond to their property would somehow damage their property? Probably their property value would be damaged is the only thing I can think of at this time. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's probably not for sure because part of it is if we use it if we have to use it, weren't we going to be kind of improving the quality and get rid of some of the algae and that kind of stuff? And that yeah, only improving go. water quality. And we're currently going through the the permitting as being submitted this week through R, and that includes a public notice to go to the property owners in the affected area. So I believe that will be their chance for input into the project. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the way I envision the notice uh, requirement in the statute is if you're literally going to have to put something on their property or right. somehow make a purchase, uh, or even if it's just, you know, an easement purchase, um, putting something next to their property really doesn't qualify. Um, for the language that's in here. Um, and I think what you just said that's happening, you know, we'll, we'll address all that. Okay. I thought of that too, when we were talking about that, Mike, though. Thank you. 
<clears throat> so with the changes, would we still we still need to do a motion? Uh, of the yeah, first reading you're or? just passing it on first reading. Um, and and then when we come back, um, we'll have another discussion and kind of I'll I'll do the changes in red line so everyone can see what's different. It won't be very many things, um, and then uh, acknowledge that these changes were made at the next meeting, and then have a motion to adopt it. Well, so are you looking for a motion to pass? the resolution on the first read. That's correct. I'll make that motion. Second. I'm sorry, does that, that get made today or at the at the July meeting? I'm confused. It's just the You're first just read. Passing it on first read. Okay, on our first read. Okay, gotcha. All right, thanks, Mike. You've made the motion to pass it on the first read. I I floor see. seconded. Floor seconded, thank you. Is there any other discussion? All right, we'll roll call vote then. Uh, Laura? Aye. Mary Jane? Aye. Les? Aye. Mike Blackwell? Aye. Debbie? Aye. And I'm an aye. So all ayes, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. And I will get those bond numbers to you. Um, and then we'll go from there. I'll get a hold of you. OK. Um, in order to get our notice going, according to the timetable, um, I should be getting you that that language either today or tomorrow. I think it was 12 days before the meeting was a requirement. Um, it's 10 days ahead, it has to be public. Yeah, and you've got one of the papers that only publishes on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So, I would need to get it to them Friday. Okay. Uh, okay. Day. All right. We'll make sure and get that done and, and out to you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And thank, thank, you, for thank uh, you for joining right. and helping us understand this. It's, it's new territory for many of us. I, uh, I understand, completely understand and happy to assist. All thank right. you. And we'll talk soon. All right. Have a great All evening. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. <laughs> Adam, could you send out that timetable again? I just don't know where I've got it buried and what meeting we talked about it, or I'm kind of looking <laughs> for it, but that might I'll send that out. Thank you. All right. Uh, since we uh, got a, we're a little bit different order, we'll go now to our Indiana University water testing results with Sarah Powers. Sarah, I'm I, I'm sure you found all that fascinating for your future reference, so thank you for sitting through it. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. No problem. Uh, kind of interesting to hear about, uh, especially because that overflow pond. Uh, can you hear me okay? A little bit low okay. for me, but I have bad, bad ears. Can everybody else hear her okay? Mm -hmm. Is that better? That's good. Yes. That's, That's better. better. I moved my phone. I. I'm not used to this setup just yet. And I, my phone does my audio in my office. I've been working from home so much. Sure. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting to hear about the, the overflow and how that's gonna be changed because I do think it presents a, a major issue um, in, in now and in the future. Uh, so I don't have my screen shared with all of you, but you all received the report. Um, so I won't go over it in detail necessarily. I usually just kind of summarize things for you. Um, but based on some recommendations last year, we added some sampling locations. We also started doing the beach monitoring um, for you weekly. Uh, so that kind of has changed. We added Possum Trot as a sample location and Shuffle Creek based on the board last year recommended that Adam and I sit down and come up with some other locations to kind of broaden that perspective. So you can see those on the map at the beginning. Um, in addition, we try to vary the uh, times in which we sample so that we do incur some precipitation events uh, to see what rainfall will do to 
um, kind of the, the testing and the results, particularly on the bacteria. So we included a precipitation map um, graph kind of just in reference to the dates in which we sampled. So on 619, and I recall that Adam asked me a question about the bacteria results. Um, and what we see on 619, that was a result of me getting caught in the middle of a thunderstorm and having to stop sampling for the day, which is why there's no Chitwood samples on that date because I got, yeah, I was standing out on that bridge um, on 45 sampling bean blossom and it started lightning and I was like, okay, I'm done for the day. Not willing to die for, for us, I, I understand. <laughs> not willing to take that risk. No, but um, you did not. So most things have remained relatively consistent and constant with Lake Lemon over time. We're not seeing any major shifts or changes overall in most of the parameters. Everything's kind of the same. Um, so you have all of those results for you here in summary tables. Um, I don't, there's nothing. Is it in table four? Is that what you're looking at right now? So, Table four would be the one of those bacteria. So right now I'm just kind of skimming through table one. Everything looks pretty consistent at Riddle. So this is your Riddle May samples um, in table one. Everything's relatively consistent. Um, the plankton is relatively high in that May sample site. Uh, we did send out for analysis this year for the first time our phytoplankton was outsourced to Phycotech, and I shared those reports when I received them with Adam. So I received those reports. We actually went ahead and sent out this year's phytoplankton samples, so we should get those back pretty soon. We shipped them out yesterday, um, and I can ex go into a little bit more detail later on that. So table one, things are looking relatively consistent from May, um, sampling events, Thing in that table looks off to me, so I'm going to have to come back to that. Sorry, I had to make a note real quick. Okay, um, so we did have rain events following leading up to these sampling events, so you do see some higher numbers in the May sample sites for like E. coli and things, but typically those are relatively low. Um, then we have table two, similar trends. Um, we start to see increasing nutrients later in the summer, um, more productivity and more growth overall, which is consistent and normal. Um, and then table three gives us our July results. Um, we don't have the plankton results for Riddle Point for July. We only have them for Reed Point at this point, because when we sampled this, it was part of another project per se. So it got grouped into a different set of algal samples when we shipped that out. Um, so those results aren't back yet. But this was the one that we did have a concerning result. Uh, the plankton number per liter came back really high. And I shared this report with Adam as well. So he's seen it. It's in a separate report. But the HAB concentration was re really high. Um, during that July sampling date, which hazardous algal bloom population. So that the possibility of toxin producing, uh, basically there's a lot of toxin producing algae in the lake during this sampling event. That doesn't necessarily mean that they per were producing toxins, but they are there and they could produce toxins. Um, based on the report we received back, uh, they would have recommended that toxin analysis have been done after that sampling event because the concentration of algae were so high that can produce um, toxins in the lake. And to chime in there real quick, that's why we're going to be or why they started outsourcing them so we can get a quicker turnaround from the time that we sample if there's high algal blooms we can send it to them to get a higher turnaround and have more real time reactionary time in case we do see elevated levels of the blue greens and hazardous algal blooms. And then what would you do? Somehow you can fix it with some sort of treatment or? Have to, there's not really, like you can get that, sorry if you want. <laughs> so there's not a lot that you can do to treat it. There are some treatments where you can apply chemical and kill the algae. There are algicides out there. 
um, for a lake of this size, that would be pretty costly to try to um, put an algicide in the lake. Usually you put out, um, so whenever you have a high cell count like this, when the, so IDEM samples the, um, some of the public recreation beaches for the state of Indiana. What they do is they put out a uh, advisory that they there was a high cell count in the lake found. Um, so you, uh, many people talk about these or have seen them at Lake Monroe. Uh, so they'll put a public advisory out that they saw over 100,000 cells per milliliter of algae, um, blue green algae during that sampling event. And then based on that result, um, they just put out a health advisory. So take a bath after you've been in the lake. Don't let your pet swim in the lake. Don't let your pet drink the water. Be aware of children. So there's a lot of things that you can do like that. If treatment isn't usually um, really an option, especially at the size and scale that you're at. Um, so we're interested to see what the riddle samples look like from that date. Um, but we did already go ahead and send out our May and June sam samples to them. So the contract hadn't been put in place yet for the summer, but we did get June out that we sampled just last week. So they have them. So Sarah, when, when you get a high reading like that, I mean, is it possible it's just contained to that area or you expect it'll show that it was kind of all over the place? So, so far, what we've been seeing is Particularly, there's a particular algae that produces kind of that brownish color in the overflow pond, and it's called Raphidiolopsis, um, and it produces a toxin called Slendrospermopsin. Um, so, so far, it's been mostly that particular algae and some other have producers, but it's been more in that end of the lake and the other end of the lake while it's there, it's not usually in as high of concentrations. Um, mm -hmm. There's not as much because of those transitional zones of the reservoir, things start to settle out, right? Why the dredging project is happening. Um, because things settle out as you move down, so you have less nutrients and material available as you move through the reservoir. Um, okay. And the conditions, the water, you have more stratification, cooler waters, um, less kind of warm, really nutrient rich waters um, kind of that are indicative of that shallower end. So that plankton, I mean, it's showing over 13 million. What should it be? So that's 13 million plankton total. That's not your HAB producers. And I apologize, I should have included that report um, as well for you. And I've annotated it um, here and I'll send a copy of Ad with to Adam to share with the board as well on the overall breakdown of what that looks like. So that's 13 million natural units per liter. Uh, so that's a little bit different than the cells per milliliter. Um, typically with the blue grain algae, we're looking at cells per milliliter. And if we go, let me just compare real quick. From the July sample, uh, when we did get the warning on it, the counts were, oh, I just have, I don't have the summary count on this paper, sorry. <clears throat> well, so this thing that says blue-green dominant cells per milliliter 97, what, is that part of it? Yeah, are they all related? I had the same question. 97% so of them were blue green algae it was dominated by those of the sample 97 percent of it was blue so 97 percent of the 13 million so whenever you look at it whenever we're talking about blue green algae advisories we use cells per milliliter rather than natural units per milliliter uh, natural units is a colony forming group so algae will tend to form a colonial group and that's individual colonies that you see in a whole liter of water. Whenever we look at um, blue-green algae specifically, and we're concerned about toxin producers, you look at individual cells in that colony. So while you often have 
so you're talking about a larger volume of water, the number in there, but the cells per milliliter is a much smaller, finer scale of measurement, and that's what's used to issue recreational advisories. And, and what, to Les's point, what should that be? Like, if, if we're looking at this 97%. What's ideal? Uh, I don't know if there's really an ideal number. I mean, the algae are important for the lake. Are critical they're the base of the food chain so you don't have any fish if you don't have any algae they have to have the food um but what we're the phycotech about... report sarah and uh -huh. it's shown to have the hazardous algal bloom relative concentration at 16 percent a relative bio volume at two percent on that that sample so it'll be two percent of the bio volume of the algae is that correct would be the hazardous algal I, what date are you looking at? Because I have had relative bio volume on July 30th is 57%. And the HAB relative concentration, so this is HABs, not just blue green algae, HAB specifically, 56%. So you can think that 56% of that, uh, 176,000 is hazard this algal bloom possible forming groups, organisms. I was on a different date. So 56% of that, that algal biomass was potentially hazardous algal producing. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that seems like a significant number, something we need to pay attention to. Right. That, that's what I was getting at is at what point do we need to be concerned about public safety. This is a concern. And that's why we're shipping the samples out now so that we can get a faster turnaround because this is concerning. Um, I particularly think, and this is just my general assessment, that the overflow pond might not be helping the issue. Um, they opened up, so we didn't used to see as high of concentrations of algae in that area. And then they open the overflow pond is full of it and they opened up the culvert between the two. And I think that some of it, now that that's more open, there's a higher water exchange. There's not a huge water exchange, but there is more water exchange. So it could somewhat be coming from there as well or not helping the situation anyway. I'm not positive of that. Um, How could we become uh, more informed about that. About the issue of whether the overflow pond is causing the problem or not. Is there a way to determine that? I'm not positive if there <laughs> is, um, other than doing a lot more testing in the overflow pond, but I don't know if that's something that is a good avenue of time and resources if the plan is to kind of convert it into a wetland that maybe will now clean up some of that instead. Well, what you could get perspective though, Sarah, on is you could probably supply the board with the historical data and then we would know at what point that culvert was opened. And then if we had sort of readings after that, I mean, that would inform us right. somewhat. We maybe. haven't really collected enough in <laughs> within the overflow itself to know if that's changed. Like we are just monitoring it to see when it does have high density. So I can let Adam know. So if you want to post a recreational advisory that people should not be fishing and boating in that pond, um, or maybe want to just at least be aware of it. Um, so basically we have passed blue green algae uh, data that I can take a look at from Reed and see if that has, how that has changed. I will say that the numbers are not directly comparable between what we used to do and what we are doing. They are comparable, but not directly. One is done with an automated instrument where you get a lot more detailed information. Um, it's just a different type of analysis, but it's very similar. It's very similar, but it's not like comparing an apple to an apple. Exactly. And this is year old data too. I mean, this is 
this, this is, is a year old. So we should have new data really soon. I do have samples from the beach right now that we're going to scan tomorrow and one from the overflow pond. I was out in the field the past two days, so haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, but we picked up those. So I'm going to take a look because the overflow pond right now does look really brown. Hey, to, to clarify on that culvert issue, though, mm -hmm. if I have this right, um, you know, there used to be one culvert. And then I think might have even been when the big flood in 2008 or whatever it got washed out. So the county came back in and rather than replace it, they just put another pipe on top of it. And therefore, the water exchange was not occurring except during periods of high water. Mm -hmm. I've been, I do recall then we had somebody out here was talking about that. And next thing we know, they put in a second pipe more to the west that is lower in the water. So I don't know. I guess it, maybe the flow helps or maybe it hurts. Uh, yeah. They did install a new pipe last summer because I've uh, had some people reaching out to me to ask me about it. And their hope was to request that the city or county put in more of those culverts to improve the water exchange between the lake and the overflow pond because they were hoping that it would help mitigate the, um, the algal issues in the overflow pond. I mean, it may help in the overflow pond, but it may also create more issues in the lake with those algal blooms too, like, right? So there's a double-edged sword that it could, in fact, create more problems in the larger part. I don't know that for certain. So the best course of action would be to, I mean, the, the overflow pond is just a prime breeding ground right now because there's low connectivity to the lake. We have drought seasons in you know July, August, September, and there's zero vegetation right there to take up nutrients, and there's no wave action or anything to stir it up. So there's just that's prime grounds for creating these hazardous algal blooms. Really, the best course of action would be to get some vegetation in there to take up those nutrients. But the the alarming trend that you're seeing, not just on Lake Lemon, and this is why Monroe Lake Monroe already has blue green algae warnings out and the lakes around the state do um it's just there's they're happening earlier and earlier um with all the rains that we're getting early on you these nutrient rich lakes then you have these really warm temperatures um so just all the the lakes and especially reservoirs are just training to more and more of this hazardous algae definitely not isolated to just lake lemon i'm seeing it and hearing about it more and more across the state talking to everybody. So it's not an isolated occurrence. I think it is important to come up with a response plan though of what, how you will advise the public on it. I would support the need for some more information uh, and then to come back to this discussion at that time. Does that seem fair to everybody? Yeah, and I also, I remember talking about, and great job, Sarah. I mean, I, you know, this is our main responsibility is the quality of the water. So appreciate that. But I don't ever remember seeing the written conclusions and recommendations. It's just like less is questions. Like we see all these tables and all these numbers and it was, sure would be nice now upon our further discussion, you know, to go ahead and give us some bullet points. Like this is what you should worry about. This is what you shouldn't, you know. Absolutely. I will write those up for you and make sure you get those next week. Thank you. That's helpful to me. Absolutely. I, I agree. I will write them up in the report and get that back to you, as well as include some of the summary stuff from this other report that I had shared with Adam. Okay. And I also have some bacteria results and things that we already have in from this year. So I'd be happy. I did. I worry about kind of blending the two and providing too much of this year with last year and confusing what what is what. So we can make up just a separate summary with this year's information that we do have because a lot of the analysis isn't done yet, but the bacteria has a 24 hour turnaround. So that's really quick. Um, whereas some of the other data is not as fast. We're still okay. processing. So. so do you think that would be the July meeting, Adam? 
Yeah, we could we could have that there. And one of the biggest safety issues and benefits that we're going to receive is the ability to outsource that algae to FICO tech, because then we can turn around and get a, a greater, more in-depth analysis like we received from last year. So that's really going to be where the saving grace comes from from a public health standpoint. Because I mean, they're very eutrophic lakes. So you're never going to, you're not going to stop the production of the algae. So really what you can do is have as early warning system as possible. But uh, I, I would uh, emphasize, you know, us getting some of the conclusions and recommendations uh, would be helpful because, you know, right now it's kind of a blank spot on, on the report and it kind of give us something to go on. And then the other thing though, just that I noticed is that I guess it's Knob Creek. I think they're the big winner on E. coli. And I think that's been pretty consistent. And is that, remind me, is that because there's a farm, uh, of a feedlot or something there or? Knob Creek system? comes from the Knob Hill area and it's training two creeks that come together and flow across the road from the Knob Hill neighborhood. And it was maybe, I think it's a Monroe County. Is it Monroe County? I believe. It's in Monroe County. And it's, it's always been a very contentious oh. spot. It's coming off the trailer park. Oh, okay. Right Sorry. There. All right. I, I didn't make the connection. I, I thought that that creek was, uh, went by a different name that sort of reflected all this uh, in there. <laughs> Not on paper. <laughs> Do you have an update okay, on Okay, sorry. I, I didn't make a connection that that was, yeah, okay, I get it. And yeah, that's a problem. I think that's Is there an update <laughs> to that, Adam? Is there an update to that? They, so I met last year with both the county and the state health departments there, and they were in the process of tracking down the owners and seeing what they can do. So it's it's at the state level health department for dealing with that because it is a major violator. Um, so, but I really haven't received any any more updates on that. I know they're having a heck of a time getting a hold of the owners and all these shell companies and they're out of state. Um, right, but it's been that way for a while. I think we need to follow up on that. Like, I don't know if Sarah's the person to do it, but we've got a report and we've got some real data and I don't know what data they're going off of, but to me, we've got a vested interest. We've got an obligation to protect the quality of the water, and we know it's bad, and it's been bad for a while. But so and We've shared all this with the health departments, yeah. um, and they kind of discredited a little bit since we are sampling from the lakeside, and they went in and were sampling from the trailer park side, um, saying that that was more accurate. I sample from the trailer park side. I oh, really? sample from the lake. All right, uh, I'm actually sampling before the culvert crosses the road. So right there where the mailboxes are um, for that addition, I pull off right there and I sample the culvert where the two creeks come together. Uh, sometimes one is dry and the other one flows more. We used to sample from over by the marina and that was not the correct spot to sample. So when I did my reassessment and kind of evaluation a few years ago, I changed that location to a more accurate depiction. Um, I happen to have a grad student who's working for me right now, who also works at the health department here, the Monroe County Health Department, doing permitting um, for septic systems and compliance. So let me chat with her on Friday. Well, she's out this Friday, so it'll be early next week, but I'll chat with her at least email and see. I feel like she maybe mentioned something about that area to me. Um, so that at least. Well, I just feel like a letter from you, Adam, and maybe Pam or something, or, you know, I don't know if it elevates to an attorney, but hey, we're like, we're concerned, you know, this is our thing. You know, what are you doing about it? I don't know. And I will send them this data from last year and clarify the sampling point where we're sampling yeah. from so they know it's coming from there. I'm glad to learn We've that. We've been in I contact think. with them quite a few times. Um, and I know, yeah. the last time that we were we were dealing with them, they said, you know, it's at the state level and okay. let them work their I mean, at one point they threatened to just cut off the water supply there, but I have nothing, nothing's ever happened. So well, it might be worth checking back with them. I mean, you know, squeaky wheel gets oiled, they might figure, well, nobody's complaining, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think we ought to stir the pot a little. 
Well, I have the contact information, so I'll get back to them with these results as well and follow up on the. And then, Sarah, you follow. I can send this. you this year's as well. All right, thank you. Oh, I already did. Yeah. Yeah. I sent those before your last meeting. Yeah. Well, Sarah, yeah. we, we look forward to further information from you. Do you have other things to share at this point? I don't. I think okay. that's why I'll send you would some. You like, would you like to go home for dinner? I would. I think my family's looking for me. They drove to town. Too. All right. Well, we want to thank you as always for your time and expertise, and we'll look forward to more information and uh, we'll discuss as we get it. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye, Sarah. All right. Okay. Mike Blackwell, the treasurer's report is what I have on my list as next. Uh, are you? I'll be brief if you're, if you're ready. That sounds great. <clears throat> Uh, for May of 2020, been a pretty good month. Uh, 96,031 in income, 36,441 in expenses. Most of the income from watercraft permits and uh, dredging and riprap income, actually. So, um, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, do the math. I apologize. It's almost 50 some thousand dollars net income for the month. Is that a record? Uh, well, it's a pretty good month. Cool. <laughs> Seems like a world record. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, moving right along, pardon me. Moving right along. Uh, if there are no discussions, no questions, we can do a motion for report of claims approval. I would make that motion. I do have one thing to point out on the financials, though, because I know I, call, I texted Adam about this, but I think it's important that on the balance sheet that we've got a $235,000 liability on there and we've got that articulating truck on there. So, you know, it's the first time we've had that kind of sizable debt on there. So I would just point that out. And the fact that year to date, it was a good month, but year to date, we're still in a net loss position, but it's kind of comparable to May of 19 as well, like year to date. And our taxes have been received. Um, so I think usually about June, after we get the June financials, when we start getting into the non -debt. Income. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I wasn't sure whether it was a May 20th of 2020 or May 2020 when you, when you sent it out. It just said May 20, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, I was where, where the taxes were. Sorry. Go no, I just returning back to your re report of claims. If, if you've made a motion, Madam Chair, I believe I did. Second. Um, thank you. Uh, motion's been made and second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Mike, we got to do a roll call vote. Oh, sorry, it's it's public know, access yeah. rules. Yes, yeah. oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead if you like. Uh, Madam Chair, you go first. Aye. Mary Jane. Aye. Les. Aye. Laura. Aye. Debbie. Aye. And I'm an aye. I just went across the screen, folks. <laughs> no order. Okay, uh, motion has been made and seconded. Reported claims have been approved. Uh, you want me to start on the budget? That's that's the last thing I have for you. If you... Okay, um, so we've had two, go ahead, somebody raise their hand. We've had two meetings. Um, you know, what we did was we went with revenues first. Is that okay? Is that please everyone? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to just run right down here. And if you just look at the 2020 where we're at right now and what we're proposing for 2021, <clears throat> the first four things are going to stay flat. Um, and then now we will be coming back and, and uh, looking at these, um, at these tax increases, obviously. Um, so what we have done to pay for the, the $1.2 million bond is we, ra we raised the tax one more time, it, not very significantly, $5,000 for Brown County, $15,000 for Monroe County. I'm sure we're gonna take a look at that probably next month. <clears throat> uh, moving along, cumulative, cumulative improvement fund, Adam got uh, uh, correspondence from the state that that has been accepted, $45,000. Moving down the list here, 
Um, everything is flat until we get the park admission fees. We added a thousand dollars there. Uh, stays flat again until we're seeing an increase in dredging riprap income. We added a $10,000 income there to make it $40,000. And then sediment removal bond loan proceeds has been reduced by $200,000. So um, revenues then, go ahead. Thought I heard something. No, I was just saying, okay. Thank you. Um, so total, total revenues proposed for 2021, $1,657,750. Next page. Supplies. Um, supplies, merchant fees, we increased $600. Moving down to printer, copier, computer, we increased that to $200. Uh, so total cost for office supplies, an increase of only $800, 8,600 compared to this year, 7,800. Operating supplies, increase on regular gas, uh, $2,000. Increase on diesel, oil, and grease, $3,000. Total of $5,000 in that category. Repair, maintenance, and supplies, everything's flat with the exception of the riprap erosion control. We increased that $3,000. Other supplies, we increased uniforms $400 to be $1,000. And then signs and nautical marker, markers, we increased $2,000 for a total of $5,000. Uh, total supplies on this page, $73,100. Services and charges. Okay. Um, accounting services, we increased $600. Grass mowing, we decreased $4,140 down to 10860 The attorney fees uh, stayed flat. Um, <clears throat> we changed uh, consulting services. Let me catch up here. I apologize. <clears throat> we did have uh, 6330 as consult consulting engineers. Uh, we changed that to just consulting services because we have so many consultants that we're dealing with. We kept that at uh, $50,000. We added a new category, professional development. Um, I think this is an excellent category. We put $1,500 in there for professional development. We need now three full-time employees. <clears throat> that category, $72,360. It's actually decreased from this year. Communication transportation, um, professional secretarial remains flat at a thousand. Phone, internet, et cetera, increased at five hundred dollars. Uh, we reduced the hotel cost uh, from three hundred dollars to zero. Meals, we increased meals fifty dollars to two hundred. Subscriptions and memberships increased to six hundred dollars. I believe that's due to constant contact and other. Forms of okay. <clears throat> Zoom. Total in that category sixty one hundred. Did I see a hand? No, I, Zoom. I think too. We have to pay for that, right? Zoom. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the newsletter uh, we reduced six hundred dollars to zero. Ads remain flat. Other printing decreased three hundred dollars down to twelve hundred. Event planning remained the same. Total for that category thirty two hundred dollars. We increased insurance, um, and why not? Uh, we, for, this year was 45,000, we increased it 5,000 to $50,000. <clears> moving down, the electric stays flat, water stays flat. Trash, we increased $300 to $1,800. Portalettes increased 1,000 to $3,000. And the pump holding tank we may, remains flat at 800. Total for that category, $11,350. Uh, services and charges continued. <clears throat> Buildings and grounds increased $5,000 from $15,000. Boats, trucks remain flat. Sluice gate inspection for 2021, $4,500. Dredging equipment repairs remains flat at $10,000. Equipment rental, $7,500. Total $40,000 for that category. 
Moving down to other services and charges, water testing increased at 1,500 to 8,000. Lake weed treatment remains flat at 50,000. Contingency fund, we increased $5,000 for $10,000. Uh, marina sales remains flat. A cumulative maintenance fund, we're still gonna put money in there at $7,500. Dam spillway, the dam spillway inspection, um, <laughs> Five thousand dollars. Does anybody else think that's funny? Yeah, <laughs> somebody did. I, I got to Thank you. Um, disposal site prep increased five thousand dollars to twenty thousand, and the debt service bond repayment uh, increased eighteen thousand to eighty-five thousand. These will change when Adam talks to Baker Tilly and finds out about the uh, uh, debt service levy. One comment I'll make about the debt service levy is that will go away when we pay that off. So we need to think about, we have raised taxes at the 67,000. We need to think about is that, do we want to keep that there? Just put it in your head. That, that was okay. okay. Uh, so I finished off with debt service. That'll definitely change when Adam gets more information. Okay, let's see. We removed, uh, eliminated 6580 erosion, 6640 soil testing, 6650 pre sediment management, and 6663 uh, silt container barge mobilization, et cetera. Those four categories were zeros uh, for forever, so we just removed them. Um, Debris removal was increased $500 to $2,000. The remaining categories remain flat. Total services and charges, $382,810. Okay. Capital and summary. Um, so everything remains flat except for the off-road truck. Uh, in 2020, it was $200,000 this year. Next year, it'll be zero. Moving down, sediment mitig mitigation uh, will be 950,000. Now, I believe Adam and I will have to ask for a uh, uh, reduction in the, in the budget for 2020 because we don't know what that's gonna be look like uh, when we have our meeting with Heather Witzman. That's correct. And that'll be kind of based on who we decide to get the bond service through with SRF. It would be the draw type bond. And then if we did open market, we would receive all those funds at once. <clears throat> Total uh, 2021 budget uh, for that, for that, for those categories, $950,000. It was reduced by 200,000. Uh, patrol boat trailer zero, pickup truck zero, park improvement, we increased $15,000 to $45,000. Total for that category, $45,000. Total expenditures budget, $1,687,810. <clears throat> okay. Last page. Okay. Um, District manager, we, we raised uh, district manager's income from 62,000 to 65,000. And park operations supervisor, which is Alex, 36,050 to 37,200. Equipment operations supervisor, which is Clinton, $40,000 to 41,200. The remaining categories will increase as we pay their benefits, okay? They're just, they will increase by the, the wages that we're paying. Um, you can look at those lines if you want me to read them, I can, but they will all increase. Total salaries and benefits, 191700 compared to 182750 this year. <clears throat> so let me go to my cheat sheet here. Uh, so then what we did with the gate park attendance, uh, the lake patrol, the dredger, not the dredger, I apologize. The push boat operator uh, was, um, we increased them accordingly by the number of years that they've been here. So as we go down, we just, um, I think we use Scott as, a, as an example. He's getting 950 an hour, he's gonna go to 10. Uh, so that's, that category is $23,000. Uh, 
uh, patrol boat. Um, uh, I think his name is Jim. He's going to go to $2,000. Uh, the rest are zeros until we get down to our push boat operator. Uh, I think uh, Roger was getting eighteen fifty an hour. He's going to go to $19 an hour. Total cost of $9,500. And uh, that just continues on down to the $5,700 mark at 61 for the category 6114. Uh, push boat operator again um, for private jobs. We're estimating $5,000. Total hourly and seasonal employees, $45,200 compared to $44,000 this year. If I can jump in there, Mike, real quick. Oh, Just yes. on the, uh, the push boat operator, we have transferred around some of the funds to increase the private line item and then actually decrease the LLCD dredging line item in, in anticipation of increasing our private work um, for revenue next year. Thank you. And so uh, let's see, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, concludes uh, my first read of the 2021 budget. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. And then we will we will have the next read at the July meeting, uh, and then the final read and the last time to make changes. Just as a reminder, will be August, and then it goes. Uh, for approval, final approval in September. Is that right? Yeah. I would before add, November first. Pardon me. October thirty first. Oh, whoops! You know we used to have a separate meeting for it in September. That's where my brain is. Okay, uh, Debbie, I think you were first, unless I see your hand. Hang on, Debbie. Well, I was just going to note that overall we're budgeting for a deficit of thirty thousand dollars and part of that is that park improvement which is the gatehouse that we didn't put in last year and in anticipation of getting report and being able to try to do something and i guess as a on the budget committee the one thing i didn't totally understand um was that when we put that increase in in terms of a rate you know, if you really looked at your property tax bill and I'm kind of asking the budget committee to just kind of go back and take another look at this and maybe in conjunction with the payment on the, you know, the taxes and everything that we need for the bond, we can look at this, but, you know, we've just put a set amount that we want. So for example, I think assessed values in Monroe County skyrocketed quite a bit. And that means that the rate that we would pay per hundred dollars on the conservancy district is really lower. So it provided us some of that. And it's just kind of a philosophical thing to kind of take a look at being that, you know, the last two years we're approving deficit budgets three years ago, we didn't, but I just want to point that out. Okay. Thank you. Les. Okay. Well, I did want just to get some clarification on the gatehouse uh, cause you know, we were going to try to do it, last spring and kind of ran out of time. So uh, am I correct then that that 45,000, it's just gonna carry over to the 2021 and we're gonna do it in 2021? Are you still gonna try to squeeze it in at the end of this year? So we decided that we would utilize the $30,000 that were budgeted for the gatehouse to pay for the park master plan. In 2021, we do have $45,000 in capital improvements which would come in from the cumulative improvement fund. So we could utilize that for the capital improvements next year. Okay, yeah, I guess I didn't recall the shifting of that money, but um, so is that something though that you can work on earlier in the season so we could get, actually get it in place for next year before things open up? Yeah, I think, I think along with this park master plan, we can kind of design, you know, what type of, <laughs> what type of designs are looking at and my goal would be to have that in i mean that's still number one priority in my mind and we'll see what the board decides but i would love to have that in over the winter time and prior to the start of the season yeah, the okay of that plan and when we're going to get that from the consultant isn't until it wasn't really supposed to be till december or january is that true i think it's scheduled for january um at the latest but she believes we should we can anticipate it to be sooner than that that seemed fair or less? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I, mean, I don't think anybody's anybody doubts we need to get this going. So we're just, yeah, I just didn't want to slip through the crack. You know. 
Um, a couple other things really quickly is I have heard back from the Department of Local Government Finance. So we will have to take our cumulative improvement fund tax revenue and expenditures, expenditures, and that will be considered a completely separate fund. So right now we do have our general fund. As we're budgeting now, and I did create in Gateway, we will have a general fund and the cumulative improvement fund as two. And actually uh, when Mike was going through the budget, I uh, had myself on mute and I was emailing Baker Tilly to find out about the debt repayment. Um, so that could be a potentially third fund if that does in fact need to be a completely separate tax um, from our special benefits tax. So I'll get back with that, but there will be a little bit of changing with the funds that we actually are operating out of moving into next year. And we'll reflect those changes at the July meeting. Okay. Thank you. All right, Michael, thank you. That's a good stab, first first stab at it. Um, Adam, will you please finish your manager's report? Uh, the long piece is over with the sediment project, but you've got a dredging, a vegetation, and a fireworks update for us, I think. Yeah, and that should be pretty quick. Uh, dredging totals as of yesterday were at 2,396 total yards. We have re removed 1,300 yards out of Dorothy Lane. Um, so we're, uh, we're trucking along with that and it's going pretty good. We are utilizing both barges in there. We need the small one to fit into the channels and we kind of leave the big one um, out in the creek for, for trucking the sediment back and forth. So that's going pretty, pretty well. Um, vegetation control, we did treat on Friday, June 5th. We treated 36.2 acres of Eurasian milfoil as a cost of just over $21,000 for the Eurasian milfoil. Uh, me and Alex will be going back out tomorrow to do an additional vegetation survey to make sure that we agree that there was at least a 90% kill in the areas that we had on the mapping. We'll also be mapping out additional submersive species or underwater species. Uh, for some reason this year with the grant, DNR made us treat Eurasian milfoil alone prior to us doing mixed submersed vegetation. Um, from my initial uh, vegetation surveys, I think over 90% was Eurasian water milfoil. There wasn't much else there, um, but we'll get out tomorrow. So if there wasn't as much of a kill off where we expected or different vegetation, we can mark that down. Yes, Mike? Uh, would you please go over by uh, uh, Walker Lane Channel and look at the uh, vegetation that's growing up in there. Uh, yep. I, did, I did get a question that um, I don't think they got sprayed in there and it may not have been on the map, but if you'd please go by and look at it. Absolutely. Are, thank you. Yep. Um, and yeah, so I, I remember when we were in, in some of the Chihuahua channels, we were seeing curly leaf and um, spatter dock, which is the little lily pads on there. Yeah. And uh, so we will make sure to do that, but we'll map all that out and make sure that's included in this next yeah. one. Thank you. Um, so that's where we are with vegetation control. Um, I'm st just starting to see the lotus pop up. We generally don't treat that until towards the end of July. With the fireworks, uh, we did tentatively schedule based on some discussions for July 4th. Um, we will actually need a motion to modify the fireworks contract to a date of July 4th rather than July 3rd. Um, so there's no discussion and we've been kind of advertised. I'd like to seek a motion to amend the 2020 fireworks contract to a date of July 3rd. We need a rain date to, to July 4th. 4th. July 4th. Saturday, July 4th. Yes, the contract was initially July 3rd. Um, what, Saturday, July 4th. What, what is the rain date? The 5th. Currently it's Sunday the 5th. And I mean, we could we could look at changing that. Um, knock on wood, we've never had to use a rain date. Um, this will be the year. <laughs> I, I hope not, because I think that Sunday date would be very questionable for a lot of people. Uh, I have no problem with the 4th, but let's pray that it goes off, because it'd be, it'd be neat. It's our, probably our one chance with all the cancellations, but. Right. Yes, Mary Jane? I'll make the motion if we're ready. All right. I'll second it. All right. It's been moved and seconded that we have the fireworks on Saturday, July 4th. 
Uh, currently, the rain date is set for Sunday the 5th. However, I assume that might be subject to discussion if, in fact, we need it, Adam, or are we locked into that? No, I mean, we can we can discuss that. I mean, it's it's in the contract there. We have to do a, a last-minute audible if we needed to. Um, okay. Well, let's hope we don't need it. All right, it's been so. moved and seconded then for the fireworks to be July 4th. Uh, any further discussion? All right, Lester, how do you vote? Aye. Michael? Aye. Debbie? Aye. Mary Jane? Aye. And I'm an I. All eyes and motion carries. Oh, and you know, Laura. And Laura. I'm sorry, Laura. I'm sorry. The, the boxes keep changing. Yeah, are you an I? Yes. Oh, yes. Good. All right. Thank you. Hey, my my you, fault. Do you want uh, Les's cat to vote? It's the cat, yeah. <laughs> and then we have been doing pretty good on the donations. And Alex, are you? Do you know offhand where we were at the other day? I believe it was just sixty-eight eighty-five. I think. All right, so we're just over sixty-eight thousand, and that's just freeholder donations. Sixty-eight hundred, yeah. Still rolling in. Sixty-eight hundred. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Um, that add ends your report, Adam, I assume, yeah. nothing else? Okay, uh, that brings us to public comment. Uh, Alex, this is where you get to be me. Uh, and uh, the hour is late, it's uh, 6 11 and we always try to keep it to about 90 minutes. So I would encourage, uh, encourage these comments to be uh, brief. All right, so we have Um, Rebecca Ball and Brenda Pendexter have a lot of uh, questions and comments about um, uh, utilizing the overflow pond and uh, turning that into a wetland. I'll try my best to kind of summarize up their sort of questions here. It may be better for um, Adam to just get in contact with them in person or like directly rather I than I think that could could be a good plan, especially since, as we did say last uh, meeting, we haven't uh, made an official de determination on which way we're going to go, uh, which would you know would or would not necessitate needing to use that pond. Right. So I still feel like this is a bit premature. If they would be agreeable uh, to sitting down with Adam, I'd be happy to sit with you as well. Or, or anyone else they'd care to have, as long as we don't exceed our board member number, uh, I would I would recommend that that would be our best best case scenario. And for okay. a brief clarification, the DNR permitting that has been submitted, if approved and as part of the approval, we'll have what our vegetation planting plan is. So we have not gotten to any types of design or or planting mitigation plans and we will include them in those conversations with the consultants. We just don't have the information yet to-, to We do not, and the, if we use it or not, is gonna depend on whether we utilize the state revolving fund or the open market. So I don't think there's any- Right, and, and if we need to, we still don't have the plans as to what it might look like. Do you have any timetable for when those might be back to help us with this discussion? Um, they've been they've been submitted. Um, so they're getting ready to send out the public notices on that. Um, I think most of the permitting they shoot for 45 days for the approval. Um, I should know within probably the next two weeks okay. uh, if we're going to be required at this time to do that planting plan. Um, it's it's moving at the speed of government though at the state level, so I mean it's it's hard to give an exact time frame. Okay. Wouldn't this water quality also having more information about that issue? Oh, I think. Absolutely. Informative. Absolutely, yeah. Debbie. And that yeah. seems like we should have that within a, a few weeks if I heard uh, Sarah correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Alex. So they had, so they just had questions and um, comments about the overflow pond and its utilization and um, the quality of water there with the algae and some thoughts on that, which um, Brenda just messaged in the chat saying that they are open to getting together and just having a, a better discussion about this rather than trying to bring it all up in our board meeting. 
Um, Frank would like it to be known that the Lake Lemon Environmental Cooperative still requests a letter that the LLCD is not interested in creating a wastewater treatment facility and supports the LLEC to do so. Okay. Yes, we did make that commitment, Frank. Apologies, we need to get that done and we've been a little overwhelmed. Um, can we draw that up? Do we have something somewhat of a standard letter we could use for that, Adam? And I can talk to you about that later on this week. Yeah, I can just give you a call and we can draft that up together. That's I think okay. it can be pretty pretty generic stating that we're not interested in yeah. running don't think it needs programs. Yeah. And well, I would suggest we run it by our attorneys too. Okay, fair, mm -hmm. I agree. Frank, can you provide us with exactly uh, who need, that needs to go to uh, in the interim? Or maybe you already have. I, I don't have that knowledge. I believe they just requested it to himself. Okay. I just wonder if anybody else needed to be copied. Okay. Alex, are we, are we good? Uh, yeah, I, um, I posted in there asking if that was satisfactory for everyone watching. Um, no responses yet, so. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so the next meeting, as referenced earlier, is uh, scheduled for July 18th at 10 at the Shelter House. I think uh, as per earlier discussion, if uh, stage five begins July the 5th, is that right? I think fourth, the state's wide open in the stage five, they say. I think just as we have done, if it's agreeable with everyone, we need to wait and see what the mandates are, recheck with Lance, our insurance advisor, as we get a little closer. You know, I would love to be sitting in that shelter house with all of you uh, in July, if it's safe to do so. Um, if you can be a little flexible, I think we should kind of go at it the way we've, we've gone at it um, and, and wait till we get more information, if that's okay. Yes, Alex. Um, yeah, so Frank replied saying that the letter just needs to be addressed to him as the president of the LLEC. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, all good. So uh, I would like to wish you all a safe, healthy holiday. Aren't we lucky that we get to see these fireworks from from the water. It's one of, as I always say, my second favorite day of the year next to Christmas. So I, I hope you all have a great holiday and we'll see you on the lake. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Second. Laura Third. seconded. I saw you, Laura. Uh, mm -hmm. Quick quick vote, Laura. How do you vote? Aye. Les? Aye. Mike? Aye. Debbie? Mary Jane? I and I'm an I. You guys have a wonderful evening. Enjoy this beautiful night. Thank you. Take care. Good night.